Well, we're doing a special Tuesday edition of my Sean Bull show. I was actually out with my family on family vacation. And also, we were making some big life changes that we'll tell you about in the near future. But man, we have such an incredible commentary to ground you in biblical and spiritual worldview. And we're going to look at what's happening in culture. That's what we do each week on the show. I'm doing it. This is Tuesday. We normally do it on Mondays at 10 a.m. But today, we have a special live show where I want to hear your comments. I'm going to interact with you. So make sure to share this with somebody that you know would like it. But today on the show, Israel has come into some key victories in the fight against Hamas. And your prayers for Israel are being answered. We just did a two-hour special on TBN. It was so profound just a couple of weeks ago to have leaders from across the body of Christ stand together and talk about Israel, Hamas, Palestinians, Arabs. And we had so many people from those communities sharing with us. If you haven't seen that, go to I Stand With Israel on TBN app and you could watch the whole thing. It's two hours long with Franklin Graham and Jonathan Kahn and Rabbi Jason Sobel and Sheila Walsh and so many others, Nicole Seymour and so many other incredible people. But we're going to talk today about how the strategy of flooding the Hamas tunnels is working. We're going to talk about the Hamas general being captured in Gaza. We're going to be talking about how God's moving for the sake of Israel. Then we're also going to be talking about Disney news. Elon Musk has declared a boycott and a war against Disney, and it's already hurting the company that was down in some ways. I mean, it's committing suicide as a company right now. And so he's kind of putting a nail in the coffin, one of the nails. Then my prophetic perspective and word this week is all about warfare. So Many people are seeing demons around every corner, but how do you know when you're legitimately in warfare? And what do you do about it? How do you get the decrease of warfare in your life? And how do we, I mean, there's an increase of, I don't know if you guys feel this way, but I know this is true. There's an increase of warfare globally right now, spiritually. The enemy has an agenda. He's trying to He's trying to trump what God's already doing and what God's already planned. And he can't do it. And especially when we come to alignment of faith. And so we're going to talk about both biblically, but also spiritually, how to overcome those warfare points. And so it's going to be really important. All this and more on today's show. And I want to say hi to everybody who's joining. We have quite a few people who are joining right now. Thanks so much for joining live. Some of you are saying it's your first time with the Praying Fairy. We're so glad you guys are here. I want to tell you about our sponsor today, which is True Play. They're an app and a platform, and they have games, videos, and stories that are so well done. They're completely faith-filled, and they're completely safe as well. And they're new. So I want to encourage you to help them to grow because they have in incredible games already. They have videos for your kids. They have a couple games for adults. There's one that I really like. Um, it's, oh my gosh, Stained Glass. I almost forgot his name, and I play it all the time. Uh, it's a puzzle game. But I like the characters a lot. Like you can see right now on the screen, if you're watching this, if you're not listening to my podcast, I like the characters because the characters, like there's this little girl who's wearing a tiger costume, but she's a she's a bunny, but she's pretending she's a tiger. She has a strength in God to know her courage. But there's a lot of different characters that your kids are going to relate to and that are just really fun to play. And again, there's puzzle games, there's uh, platform games. You're going to really love it. And this is a great thing to give for Christmas. They're I think they're 50% off right now on their website and you can enter in our code, which Glenn, you got to put our code on there because I'm not exactly sure what our code is. I think it's Sean Bowles, but I want to make sure because I don't have that on my notes right here. But again, I like all the stories. Thanks for everybody who's joining right now. We have Shane, one of our YouTube members. Shane, you're always here with us. We are so glad you're here. We have Darby Davis from Arizona. We have Kathy Ray from Canada. Yes. We have Gregory Dubrew. I love that name, Dubrew, from Mansfield, Texas. We were just in Texas. That's where we were doing our vacation. It was so awesome to be there, and it was so warm. It was like warm in December. It was like California weather. South Georgia and Ozark, Arkansas, and we have so many different people that are here right now. Thank you guys for joining on both Facebook and YouTube Live. Well, happy Hanukkah to our uh, just Jewish and Israel friends. And during Hanukkah, this I don't know if you know this, but children decorated menorahs, and they uh, had the candles for the uh, Hanukkah celebration for Jewish people, and they were going to give these to the soldiers and let me say this, this is such a profound story because the children were from places that had been bombed or from villages and places that had to be evacuated because they were being directly targeted by Hamas. They were from some of those areas where they were attacked and some of these children were, their parents had been killed and they made menorahs for soldiers on the ground. It was so profound. And they wrote letters to the Israel soldiers and they gave them to him just this week. And the Israel so soldiers put out a report that it was one of the biggest encouragements they had on the battlefield. And in the past 48 hours, there's been a surprise terror attack in the northern part of Gaza Strip, and they conducted a large offense against the troops. Now, this was important that there's so much encouragement by the worldwide community of prayer, and there's encouragement from even the children who've been, you know, their, their villages were under attack. And then they have this large-scale offensive against the troops. Israel was able to push back the Hamas terrorists, but it shows how the real the battle still is right now. It was just 48 hours ago. 
And the goal of Israel right now is to separate in Gaza terrorists from each other so they can not rearm. That's really important for them right now. Israel's trying to figure out how to rescue hostages who are, who've been underground for over 67 or 68 days. And we got to keep praying for the hostages, many of whom are women and children, even toddlers and elderly people. The former CEO of Facebook was able to address the United Nations and really rally support for the first time. I mean, she, this has been over eight weeks, nine weeks before she was able to address them because they weren't listening. They were looking at this act of terrorism and not putting it and quantifying in the right space as United Nations. And this was the first time they could hear more. We're going to play this clip. It's a little sensitive because they do talk about sexual assault of what happened, but they didn't, she does not go into detail. But I just want to mention that in case children are watching. Go ahead and play that clip trading sexual violence against women as a weapon of war. Israel brought that charge to the United Nations yesterday, accusing Hamas of war crimes. Israel's ambassador also called out the UN for its deafening silence about these atrocities. At the UN on Monday, the Israeli embassy sponsored a special session calling for condemnation of Hamas for using sexual violence against Israeli women on October 7th. Israeli Ambassador Gilad Erdan said there has been deafening silence from the UN, which waited too long, eight weeks, to condemn the tactics. We know this from eyewitnesses. We know this from combat paramedics. We would know this from some victims if more had been allowed to live. Maybe then one would be standing beside me right here to state something that should not need to be stated. Rape should never be used as an act of war. Keynote speaker Sheryl Sandberg, the former COO of Facebook, condemned the use of sexual violence. Hamas said the accusations were unfounded lies to demonize Palestinian resistance. The world has... And this is so sad because we know there's proof and there's medical proof and they're even willing, some of the families were willing to let their daughters be examined by neutral parties in the United Nations as part of this. It's that it's that sad that internationally, because Hamas, who's known as a lying organization, they're allowed to lie because they're extreme Islamic. They're allowed to lie if it serves the cause of what they believe is the greater truth. They're allowed to lie about anything they want to. We know that about terrorist groups, but for some reason, because the pro-Palestinian, which is linked to pro-Hamas rallies and narratives, you have people who are believing in the West that all of this is just Israel fabricating this and making this up. And it's so important that I love what Sheryl Sandberg is saying because she's like, if the women could come here and testify, you would hear it firsthand. We're seeing it firsthand. We have the medical proof. We have all these things. But yet Hamas and other terrorist groups and other Middle Eastern groups are saying this just, Iran is saying this just isn't true. It's a fabrication. And so it's so good that she was able to go there and share it because she was sharing from a place of authority with, she brought receipts, which is really to important. To decide who to believe. Do we believe the Hamas spokesperson who said that rape is forbidden, therefore it couldn't have possibly happened on October 7th? Or do we believe the women whose bodies tell us how they spent the last minutes of their lives? Who are we going to believe? About a dozen Israeli women are still held hostage by Hamas. One U.S. official said the terror group might be unwilling to release them because they might talk about abuse they've experienced in captivity. Again, this is where we're at right now. I mean, the war is happening all around the globe, not just in Israel and Hamas lands. But I just think, you know, in Gaza Strip and these other places, there's people who are fighting. I mean, I just got the report this morning about, you know, different missiles that were sent in, drones that were sent in just this week. There's a lot of attacks during Hanukkah because it's a, they're trying to destabilize and bring discouragement. And these extremists, these terrorists are so evil. And yet there's a, a moral battle happening around the globe. And we saw that with the Penn State president who has to step down over the congressional hearings where three extreme liberal presidents of colleges were grilled in, in, by Congress about their anti-Semitism on the campuses. And it's gone beyond freedom of speech. And they've all put out somewhat of apologies, but they're really weak apologies. The president of Harvard, Harvard who's been considered their worst president in history, had her staff rally around on her defense. She doesn't want to step down, nor does her staff think she should, but she's one of the lowest rated presidents in their history. Many of Harvard's benefactors and funders have said that they're going to withdraw finances to the tune of hundreds of millions 
if she's not removed, just like the other two colleges that were representative. Uh, one of them, the Penn State uh, president, is stepping down even after she released a public apology. And it's important to note that in this time when students are allowed on campus to call for the genocide of Jewish people and students are allowed to rally around as extreme terrorists and champion their cause, not just the plight of Palestinian civilians. We're not talking about that. Palestinian Hamas, the Hamas group, who are Palestinian people, spent billions of dollars creating a terror network underground to 14 years ago to launch an attack. They've been waiting for 14 years. They chose this timing. And again, I believe spiritually and even prophetically that this is a season of battle that God knew and he knew the season we'd be in on the earth. And he's He's going to use it for our good. He's going to use it for his. He loves humanity. He loves people. He loves Palestinians. He loves Jewish people. But he's going to use this attack for his good. But this is an evil, terrible time for Israel. It's an evil, terrible time for people who are not Hamas, who are not extreme Muslims, because there's so much fear and there's so much wrong narrative right now. Well, Jonathan Kahn was sharing on our TV and special that I mentioned, I stand with Israel that you can watch on the TV and app. But I'm going to play the clip from when Jonathan Kahn, who's a rabbi, who's a New York Times bestseller, one of the most influential Christians of our time. And he shared this. And I just wanted to share this with you. Jonathan Kahn. And we are living in perilous times, dangerous times, dramatic times, prophetic times. What does it all mean? Israel is at war. All around the world, there are people chanting hate to Israel, destruction to Israel, hate to the Jewish people. What does it all mean? Number one, it means that the Bible is true. The Bible is the word of God. Because the Bible says that in the last days or the end of the age, Israel will be back in the world. God will gather the Jewish people from the ends of the earth and bring them back to the land of Israel. Well, he's done it. The fact that there is an Israel in the world that there can be all this trouble over, that's a sign. It has to be. God did it. You know, for so long, there were people who denied this would ever happen throughout the year. Even people in the church said it will never happen. Well, God said it would happen. It happened. The Bible is true. God is true. Secondly, what else does it mean? These are the last days because the Bible said in the last days or in the end of the age, Israel will be the center of the focus of the world. That sounds crazy. How can a, a, a nation the size of New Jersey be the center of the entire world. Why would the whole world focus on that? Well, it's true. Here it is again. It's showing the truth of the word of God and the prophecies of Messiah's coming. You see, it, it's crazy. There's almost no other, there's really no other news story. If you go back 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years, what story was a news story then that's a news story now? It's, this, it's Israel. That's the only one. And it's all about the same issue. Ultimately, it's about the issue of Israel's existence. Number three, Israel's not just the center of the focus of the world, but the center of controversy. The Bible says it will be the center of controversy. Nations will try to move it, try to change the border. Nations will try, well, it'll be the center. And so it is again. So it, it always comes back. It might, might be a, a little lull for a little while, you know, that it's not in the news, but it always comes back. Next, it's not just the focus of controversy, it's the focus of rage and fury and anger and hatred all around the world. Well, that goes with what the Bible says. The Bible says that in the end, all the nations are going to come against this little tiny nation of Israel. I think it's super interesting that Rabbi Jason's talk, oh, Rabbi Jason, Rabbi Khan is talking about how this little nation is still so on the map. I mean, they've been the nation that's been almost genocided the most in history from the time of Esther with Haman all the way until now. There's been people who've tried to destroy them, especially in the Middle East, and they still come back on the news. And when you look at, and I've done this before, when you look at Jewish people and their impact on civilization and you look at the awards and the progression and the innovation that's happened from the small people group, it's phenomenal. And no wonder the nations are jealous over what's happened in Israel and what they use the land for and how they restored the land. Just think it's super interesting. Also, I do want to say that, uh, Di, thank you on YouTube. I meant to say University of Pennsylvania, not Penn State when I was referring to this article. I don't know why Penn State came up in my mouth, but Universal of Pennsylvania is the one that the president had to step down from. It would sound impossible, except you can see it coming. I mean, think about this. You know, the United Nations has condemned Israel more than any other nation, all nations combined together, one little nation. 
Well, that's what the Bible says. In the end, it's all, they're all going to come to Israel. And all these things are signs the Bible has given for one other thing. You see, if the Jewish people had come back, they've come back to the land of Israel. That means someone else is coming back to the land of Israel. The king is coming. If Israel's back, then the king of Israel has got to come back. And so it's a... I just think that's so cool. We're going we're gonna to stop it at that. But you can watch the rest of that on I Stand With Israel. You can watch all the leaders speaking about... I mean, Arab leaders are speaking who are Christians. You have uh, people who are Israeli who are speaking who are Christians. You have people from you know us in the West who are speaking who are Christian and sharing a, a way to pray and also good news. And I think that's incredible good news. I, I remember standing at the in the Garden of Gethsemane, looking across the Western Gate where it says in the Bible that Jesus will return and walk through the Western Gate. And one of the things that the extreme Islamic groups have done is that they've created a graveyard there because they know that it would be, uh, in the rabbinical customs, it would be bad. A, a rabbi can't step across those graves or step through, and it, so they try to pollute it just because they know the promise of the Messiah there. And so this is like, this is very real to the world, what's happening right now. It's, it's a lot of times we can be disconnected from it, but what's happening, I mean, we know that Jesus is going to return and there's going to be a new Jerusalem. We're going to spend a lot of time there. It's going to be literally in that land, superimposed, recreated, whatever. And a lot of us don't think that way as Christians or believers. And I think it's time to think that way. Well, my next story is all about Disney's implosion that's happening right now and the Elon Musk effect where Elon Musk has declared basically war on Disney. But before I talk about the Elon Musk factor of this, it's really incredible right now because uh, recently the Daily Wire Plus CEO, Jeremy, and also Patrick Bet David from uh, uh, Value Tainment did an interview together. And we're going to play a clip of that where they talk about how Disney's committing suicide right now. And I want to frame this because why does this matter before we play this? Why does this matter to you? One of the largest companies that influences children's culture and family culture in the world is going through an identity crisis and trying to project that crisis on you and your family and your children. Now, we've watched their stock go down by half. They've lost over $299 billion, B, billion dollars. Some people say it could be, by the time this is done, close upwards to a trillion dollars of loss that they could have gained. Now, realized back in 2019, they had seven films that broke a billion dollars. They've lost over a billion dollars in the films they produced without making that additional $1 billion per movie for all the movies they've released in the last just one year. We're not looking at the years before that. They've also lost several billion dollars over Disney Plus. They've lost billions of dollars in park revenue. They are on a downward spiral and they've been doing so much in the identity politic world and so much uh, edutainment that they've come out of their right identity. And this really affects some things and it affects Christianity in some, somewhat of a great way because we've been able to see companies emerge that have conservative or even Christian values. Like I talked about True Play earlier before, they were able to really be funded as a company. And there's many other groups that are being funded, like Angel Studios and others, that are being funded by a company because that money that funds those things goes somewhere. And if it's not going to Disney, it's going to go somewhere. And so it's been a really big shift. But I believe there's still purpose on Disney. I believe Disney can have a turnaround. I'm not saying it will, but I believe it could have a turnaround. But I want to play this clip, and I just think it's super relevant for today. Talk about Disney and uh, Marvel. So Disney admits the left its left wing policies hurt share, shareholders. In new SEC filing, Disney is now admitting that it is uh, uh, it's been slapped by its own customers for its far left social and political agenda. Legal expert Jonathan Turley wrote in the recent column: Disney's SEC filing, we face risks relating to misalignment with the public and consumer tastes and preferences for entertainment, travel, and consumer products. So they have to they have to release if there's any risks associated to invest. And they actually, for the first time, acknowledged, acknowledged this. So they said, well, here, we're actually misfiring in how we're preaching and we're doing Which this. Which impact demand for entertainment offering and products and that profitability, profitability of any of our businesses. We face risk related to changes in our business strategy or restructuring of our business, which has affected and may continue. This past summer, Disney stock had hit a nine-year low with its marketing cap falling from $350 billion dollars in March of 2022, $254 billion, a decline of, Vinny, you ready? Hmm. They lost $196 billion in one year. What? $196 billion in one year. Now you have to realize, like, they don't have the money to make a lot of the Marvel projects they're going to make, so they're canceling. They only have seven movies next year slated at this point, and they're all sequels, or they're all, like, $5 million in, $50 million out movies. They're not, like, the $300 million mega movies, like, Marvels, uh, the Marvels, I think, cost two hundred million plus dollars just to create, plus the marketing. That's not including the marketing. Maybe even two hundred fifty million. 
and they're just losing and bleeding money. So you not going to certain things, even if you participate with some of them, I mean, I don't blame you. Some people saw Wish, they liked it. Some people thought it was satanic, whatever. But you not participating, like, like the average person goes to a Disney movie and you start watching, you're not sure what you're going to be served. And so if you're conservative, which is over half our country, and if you're somebody who's a Christian, which is over, again, half our country, you may watch this and you're going to feel nervous over what they're going to present in the movie. And so this now, like a movie like Wish, which was pretty um, neutral, although they had a non-binary person playing the main character that wasn't represented in the movie. But it's pretty neutral, but people were holding their breath, waiting for the wokeness to appear in the movie. And so a lot of people just didn't want to go through that trauma or that torment to protect their children. They just said it's better to protect their kids from all Disney than to participate with some Disney not knowing what's going on. $96 billion, a 56% drop off in a little over a year. So when you see these types mm -hmm. of things, and by the way, this is back to back to back to back to back. It's becoming a trend with Disney. Bob Iger wrote a great book called The Ride of a Lifetime, and then he made the mistake of coming back. Do you think any of this is his blame? Is any of it Bob Iger's fault? Of course it is. Bob Iger wasn't uninvolved in setting the stage for what was going to come after him. You know, you, you're not Bob Iger and then shock, shocked and dismayed to figure out who they replace you with. Uh, so yeah, Bob, Bob Iger put a lot of this in place. Yes, one of the great executives of our time. As to why he came back, you know, does Michael Jordan still play basketball? It's almost impossible to ever walk away from the thing that you're uniquely gifted at. And we see it with professional athletes all the time that they they come back after their heyday and 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 do poorly, but they can't walk away from the game. So I get that he can't walk away from the game and he can't walk away from his legacy. And he's a greater executive than anybody at this table will ever be. But that doesn't mean that he hasn't made his billion dollar mistakes. And I think he's he's dealing with one right now. Yes, the window of time that it takes for these things to come out is a huge part of it. If Disney decided today, uh, we're only going to make movies about uh, Bible stories. Well, you wouldn't get one of those movies about Bible stories for three years. But there's just that's just the reality of of what that process looks like. So, so that. So I think that is an interesting point because so much of what's being released on Disney Plus, on Disney Channel, on in feature films were back when they started doing a lot of the diversity inclusion stuff. They were also, and when I say that diversity inclusion is not bad, but the extreme form of it that's come with the woke agenda is extremely bad. So having diversity is beautiful, but having diversity inclusion as a legalistic department in your company, which was voted down by several groups, like even the Supreme Court says you can't have, um, you know, in colleges anymore, prefer preferential treating treatment over one race over another for, you know, college education. So that was voted down. So a lot of these companies fired their diversity inclusion employees or, or you know, their executives. And on top of that, you have a lot of the agenda with the LGBTQ plus stuff that was going on. And when you have the LGBTQ plus stuff in every single movie, like I was looking at a list, I, I have it later on here, we'll read it. But all the Disney shows for the last three years have had some form of either gay dads or gay brother or lesbian couple, whether it's Andor, whether it's, you know, whether it's um, uh, well, anything that's come out. I mean, even Jungle Cruise, that you have the gay brother, you have every single, and they make a point of the coming out story. They make a point of validating those characters because they want to preach and they want to indoctrinate children with that agenda in every single movie and show that they do, including Lightyear. They have, you know, one of the main characters is a lesbian and they have to go through her whole story and make it like a really sensational thing. Like this is the best thing ever. And we all need to be very accepting. Now accepting the homosexual community versus being preached at or being presented in such a way that we have no way to have our own values in the midst of it is not going to work for the average middle American family. They're just not going to want to watch a homosexual love stories. We saw that big movie with the biggest romantic rom-com, gay rom-com in history. The first one that had a real budget failed so miserably because the average American or the average person in the world doesn't really want to watch a gay rom-com. That's for a very small percentage of humanity who is gay. And a very small percentage will watch that, but everybody else will not watch that. Maybe a few of their friends will watch it, but everyone else, and it shows you how small the percentage of people that are having this loud of a voice are to infect mainstream films and television with a message. Now, it's okay to have a person in it if they want to have a character in it, whatever, but they're infecting it with a message behind that person. And it's just getting exhausting. People are exhausted. Their LGBTQ plus has exhausted people like a holy crusade, like Christians did back you know, hundreds of years ago with all the crusades that Christians did when they tried to force people religiously to believe in Jesus. It never works. You can't force people to believe. People need the freedom of choice to come alongside. And this kind of edutainment is not working. Well, I'm going to play one more video from Jeremy. This is so important, what Jeremy was saying from Daily Wire Plus. I think the biggest problem that they have 
they fired everyone who knows how to engage in traditional storytelling without all of this woke nonsense in it. That's they it. created such a bubble over there that even if Bob Iger does say, Bob I if Bob Iger came out today and said, we're not even going to release the crap, we're going to take the hit. And then starting on a day three years from today, we're going to relaunch Disney. He, he doesn't have the team to do it. He said recently, you know, we, we've waded too far into politics and now we're going to not pick these controversial political fights anymore. The people, at, the people actually working for him who have to effectuate that plan do not know the difference between the controversial things they believe and the uncontroversial things that they believe because they exist within a company that's a bubble, within an industry that is a bubble, within a city that's a bubble, within a state that's a bubble. That entire you know, well documented. The the right understands the left. We disagree, but we understand the left does not understand the right. The left does not understand themselves. Disney has engaged in the greatest act of brand suicide that has probably ever happened in recorded history. The Snap! Brand suicide. That's what we call it. The left doesn't understand the right because the left is in its very own identity crisis. There's about 20 factions in the left. And depending on where you're at in the left, you're either believing the other factions or not. You're at war with yourself. You're at war with everybody else. And because of that, because Disney engaged in politics on this level, they have committed brand suicide. We're not sure they can recover from it. We're not sure that they can be resuscitated, but they've done it. The most beloved brand, the most goodwill with the most important people, parents, on behalf of the most, uh, uh, the, the most vulnerable people, children. We, we trust Disney for three consecutive generations. We as adults trust Disney with our children. Disney helped shape the worldview of every single adult in this country. We trusted them so much that we gave them tax breaks all over the country. Like, all the goodwill that came their way because they were so unique. And they created the greatest content library ever assembled in all of human history. And then they squandered it. See, I agree with that. And that's why it's so disappointing for so many of us because we love Disney when it comes to the old classic Disney. It's like there's so many other films that I think teach the best principles. My daughters have grown up with the princesses. You know, we've we've had so much of that has been so important. I want to keep playing this clip, but I just love what he's saying because they squandered it. And there was a moment in time that we're at right now where I'm hoping for recovery. I'm just a hopeful optimist. So I'm hoping for recovery, but there may not be one. The, the lesson there for anybody engaged in any kind of business is, is enormous. Uh, that if you think that you are more powerful than your audience, you have completely lost the plot. Well, according to Alex Sherman from CNBC at the New York Times Dealbook Conference on November 29th, Iger actually shared more about the potential company agenda. And he stated that the creators at Disney, this is just now, this is like a couple weeks ago, he stated the creators at Disney had lost sight of what their job should be. Now, I hope he shared it with them, not just at this conference. He said it should be to entertain first and not about messages. He said the messages that were being pushed got worse when he left as a CEO. And he said previously that he's ready to share more original stories to entertain and not push agenda. So he's basically walking back this last five to seven years saying every show got too much. And the whole article that the Hill recently released, they said when Elon Musk, owner of SpaceX and Tesla X, was being interviewed at the New York Times Dealbook Summit, I saw this, it's an incredible clip, on November 29th, reporter Andrew Ross Sorkin at the same event asked him about companies pulling their ads from his social media site. So Disney, Apple, Coca-Cola, Warner Brothers, Discovery, Comcast, and others all suspended their advertising. Now, some have walked it back, but from uh, uh, X, because Musk was you know, he reshared a post that many said were, was anti-Semitic and he immediately replied and exp explained it and, you know, like took responsibility, which is way more than a lot of these guys have done. But he said in this particular instance, he said the reality is they're using this to try and blackmail me. If someone's going to try and blackmail me with advertising, blackmail me with money, go do something to yourself. Go, he uses expletives, go do something to yourself. He says, I hope this is clear. Then he appeared to directly call out Disney CEO Bob Iger by adding, hey, Bob, if you're here in the audience, that's how I feel. The Hill noted, no matter which side of must divide is on, it's becoming clear that the mega billionaire entrepreneur is now drawing deeper lines in the sand. To prove that point, must triple down against Iger last week by firing multiple posts, criticizing Disney and outright saying Iger should be fired immediately. In response, the state of New Mexico sued Meta and Mark Zuckerberg for alleged child abuse content on the site. I mean, they have all this proof that, I mean, Zuckerberg could have stopped child abuse and child exploitation, but because they're honoring their algorithm, they didn't stop it. And Musk said, crazy that Disney has to be sued to stop this terrible behavior that, I mean, they're being sued. I mean, we've had Disney employees that, that are busted in sex predator rings. I mean, this is so sick. Next, in response to see, uh, NBC headlines stating Facebook and Instagram content enabled child sexual abuse trafficking, 
New Mexico lawsuit, Musk responded, why no advertiser boycott there, Bob Iger? You're endorsing this material, but you won't be on X. And just minutes before that, Musk had posted, Bob Iger thinks it's cool to advertise next to child exploitation material, real stand-up guy. So in other words, Facebook and Meta is experiencing something right now. One, one state is doing there's rel, uh, a ramp up of lawsuits against them because it's proven that there's sil child exploitation issues with their algorithm and they haven't addressed it. They haven't fixed it because it would lose a lot of advertisers. And Disney's okay with that, but they're not okay with being on X. That should be a statement right there. Also this week while doing an interview regard, regarding a cyber truck, Musk uh, said with regard to activism of Disney, you have to wonder what would Walt Disney think of the company that, of his namesake today? He said, I think Walt Disney is turning his grave faster than a drill bit. So in case anyone has any doubts, Musk has now openly declared war on Iger and Disney and, and a fight Iger may soon wish he never had initiated because tens of millions of people are on you know, Elon Musk's side, whether they agree with Elon Musk directly or not, they just agree with a statement that something's wrong. And that Hill article was from Douglas McKinnon. I thought it was a really good uh, article. But Disney's, you know, of course, like we said, committing brand suicide. And, you know, we we do know Bob Iger's announced stepping down in 2026. He actually wanted to step down this, I think, this year or next year, but they can't find a replacement. And new shareholders warning that Disney stock has that liability because they're not resonating with a lot of their people has caused people like a, a, a billionaire named Nelson uh, Peltz to come about a year ago. He's an activist where he comes in and he invests to turn companies around from woke agendas or from uh, liberal agendas. And he actually bought enough stock along with his partners to be able to get board seats. But he was denied board seats because of his agenda of being conservative. He wanted two board seats. He was just denied those seats. So he just went last week he went, I mean, this is incredible. He went to the shareholders directly and shared all the information, both private and the stuff that's been happening publicly with Disney and shared even the holiday lineup that's coming with the Naughty Nine, which has two gay dads. And you have this one character that could be non-binary. You have Little Demon, which is about the demonic. I mean, it's just a total demonic cartoon. You have Pauline, a love story of a girl that gets impregnated by the devil. And you have almost every recent series, again, like I talked about before, has the gay brother, the gay dads, the lesbian partners, and they're featured everywhere from Lightyear, Jungle Cruise, High School, the musical series. Loki has become bisexual, and that just has to seal the deal that Disney has more into identity politics. Right now, they demasculated men like Indiana Jones in her latest movie and make preachy films about young adult men, you know, or for young adult men about girl power like the Marvels, which just didn't resonate at all with their, their base who watches superhero movies, which is mostly young adult or teenage boys and they have to watch a movie about how boys aren't good that boys it's all about girl power and it's just got really 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 sad well i want to play this clip because there's something further happening actually you know i'm going to skip this part so i'm telling my producer i'm going to skip this part there is this whole thing that's happening right now with the disney audit that's happening in florida and there's so much corruption when it comes to the land and the tax breaks they got and even that whole tax status that there's there's an audit going on and there's some 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 information that's come to the surface that I encourage you to investigate on your own if you're interested. We won't go into it today because we just don't have a whole lot of time. But it's so important to know that this company is actively failing, but there's hope with like Nelson Peltz who might come in. That's why I still have hope is that there's these dark horses that might come in and win the race in the end, that God might restore it. I say that because I know many Disney employees who are incredible people, people at Pixar, people in Disney who are Christians who are holding the line, who are believing and they're looking at their job as a missionary job, believing that God still has a plan for Disney. And they're praying that God will turn it around. They're praying that there's a course correction. They're praying for the, all these violations to be corrected. And I think that takes some real guts to be in a company as a Christian, as a missionary to pray, just like God sends some people to countries and you don't like the government of that country, but you're praying and you're loving and you're, you're, you're having compassion and you're, and you're working there. I believe that God's sending people into companies like Disney or Target or other woke companies that need a course correction right now. And I just want to encourage you to pray with them. Pray that God would empower people in there. Pray that God would empower this, this billionaire, Nelson Peltz, who he says that he's in his 80s and he says this is his last big act in life. He wants to see the Disney company restored to its conservative values and roots. I mean, what would happen if that was truth? And right now it's so corrupt. We'd have to see a miracle, but I believe in the God of miracles, which is really good. Well, we have this month for you for Christmas special. We have our God Secrets five-year anniversary bundle. We have God Secrets is a book about words of knowledge, how to understand how God speaks through his hidden words of knowledge. And it's a gift of the Holy Spirit that he will speak to you 
And it's not just the gift of prophecy, but it's actually knowing what's in God's heart and mind about your current circumstances or your past circumstances. There's stories, there's a workbook, and there's also a masterclass all for one low price over $80 of value for $25. I'm going to encourage you to go to bullsministries.com and get this workbook, book, and masterclass to grow in the things of the spirit. Maybe there's someone in your family right now that wants to grow and it's Christmas time. It's a perfect time to actually go after it in a real way. I take you through five hours, 23 videos of teaching and activations on this, as well as you're going to have the book and the workbook. You're going to have a deep dive of theology over words and knowledge. I've never seen a book like this on this spiritual gift. I don't know if there's one on Amazon you could buy, but there's mine. So you can buy mine from bullsministries.com or Amazon, but you won't get the full bundle if you buy it there. But give it away as a, gift, a Christmas gift or give it to yourself for Christmas. Go deep in your spiritual activation. It's so important. And throughout this e-course, you're going to gain a deeper understanding of words of knowledge and their application in your life today, which is so good. Well, now we have news you need to know. And I think this is so important to talk about these. I'm going to play a clip for you. Don't disengage. This is such an important clip. You're going to be shocked. I was watching this thing. What? Do you know why you haven't seen the air marshal or anything about air marshals for a while? There is not air marshals flying on planes around you because they're still focused on something that Pelosi put them in charge of, which is to be focused on everybody who was involved with the January 6th, quote unquote, insurrection. They're still following people who walked peacefully through the White House. They're still following those people who were opened up. Now we have, I mean, we've had Mike Johnson has turned over all of the video footage and there's been companies and groups and media groups of my friends, journalists who've been scouring through trying to find the insurrection and they're not finding the acts of violence that we were told by all these politicians, even some Republicans, that there was radical insurrection. Now we're finding out that, they, that Pelosi, when she was in charge, she actually put people on all the air marshals on duty to investigate. They're still in investigation mode, 2023 people over air, over January 6th insurrectionists or potential insurrectionists. And they're not in a time when there's extreme Muslim terrorists. They're not on any planes. Let's watch this clip. Okay, so how many uh, air marshals are on planes right now? And how many do you think uh, there should be to get to a safe level? Well, Carly, we're not we're not flying right now. The only missions that we're doing are Quiet Skies missions, and those are missions that are following the January 2021 people. So we're either on the border uh, for illegal immigrants, or we're following folks from January 2021. We're not doing our regular missions where we're out there looking for the bad guys. So right now, on uh, most flights, you're not going to have air marshals. What do you mean by that? You're following January 2021 people. What does that mean? That means our primary mission is a little group called Quiet Skies. It's a mission called Quiet Skies that we're following people that flew into the national capital region in January 2021. You did not have to go to the Capitol or the rally, and you've been put on a specific list that TSA now has assigned air marshals to follow these people who have not had uh, any type of criminal investigation. They haven't committed a crime, but yet three years later, we're following the same individuals day in and day out. So you're saying that air marshals are now following people that were at the Capitol uh, on January 6th, and they're not tracking terrorists at all? Well, they didn't even have to be at the Capitol, Carly. They could have just flown into the National Capital Region. So if anybody was there for uh, a job interview, to visit family, we even had a gentleman that was there for a funeral. They put it, put on this domestic terrorist list just because of their geographic location to Washington, D.C. So these people did not even commit a crime. They weren't even at the Capitol. What? Do those people know that they're on this list? Some of them do, because when they go to the airport, they get the quadruses on their boarding pass, and then they have to go through enhanced security. Then they're followed by teams of air marshals on, on any leg of flight that they have. So yes, a lot of them do know that they're being followed, yet they haven't been vetted, and they have not committed a crime. And three years later, we're still doing the same duty, and we followed the same people over and over for three years who are no threat to this country. Oh my goodness. Okay, so if you are an average passenger on a plane, how concerned should you realistically be? 
I think I think you should be very concerned when you're boarding the aircraft. You need to look around to see who you might be able to to ask to help you, like a good Samaritan, because you're kind of you're on your own. If anything happens, please don't wait. There's going to be no law enforcement that's going to help you. So you need to have a plan. Look where the exit doors are. Look where your flight attendants are standing around you. But I would look at other passengers to see. You know, I would be looking around for a football player or somebody, a pretty big guy or a couple big guys, in case you needed to take action. Wow. I mean, are you kidding me? This is happening in America right now that our skies are not safe during the holiday season where people travel like crazy. This happened over Thanksgiving. Can you can you imagine something happens and it's up to us as citizens and depending on what state you're at, you're not even allowed to carry weapons. And of course you can't carry weapons on planes. And so you can't even defend yourself. You have to defend yourself. And we've seen some things happen. So now you understand why when these people are attacking in the sky or they're having delusional episodes or whatever, whatever's happening in the time where mental illness is at all time high in America and there's not one air marshal on a plane. Well, on top of this, Angel Studios lead actor who is in um, their, their most recent movie, he got arrested at his premiere of the movie. And uh, right after the premiere, the FBI came and arrested him because he was uh, at January 6th insurrection. He, it, there's video showing him walk all the way through from the beginning to end peacefully and then leave. So he did nothing. There was no violence around him. There was no looting around him. There was no trashing around him. He literally walked in the building. There's videos all the way through and he walked out. And you just think this is what happens to people who make Christian content is that he was happened to be at the insurrection event. He was went over to the Capitol because that's where they were all told to go. And he walked through with the escorted by police. And now he was arrested and the FBI have targeted him without telling him anything except for that he was there that day, knowing that they have no video of him doing anything other than being there in the Capitol, being escorted by police. Most of those people who were there didn't even know that they weren't allowed to be there because the police were helping him to go through. And now we can see that again because of Mike Johnson. I just think this is so terrible that this happened. Well, um, I actually said the wrong film studios. I said Angel Studios. I'm so sorry. It was actually uh, Daily Wire Plus Studios with their new movie, Lady Ballers, which is a crazy transgender uh, comedy. So it's it's kind of making fun of the whole transgender thing. And he was arrested at the FBI, uh, by the FBI at the at the uh, green carpet or red carpet event. Green carpet event. That would be cool. Red carpet event. Oh, it's just so discouraging. Why well, have good news? Not about that, but I have good news about the film industry. The Jesus film, which many of you have, may not have seen here in the West, but it's a film that was released in the 80s. It's the most viewed film in the world, used for world missions. I actually went on a missions trip to a remote area that people had never been evangelized before in Mozambique, and they played the Jesus film first. That's very common that they've done this. So the most people possibly who've ever seen any film have seen this film. This Jesus film is now going to have an animated version released for 2025 that will be more relevant. This has been a little dated, the Jesus film project, if you watch it. It's a little dated. It's a little It's a little intense. And they're going to release an animated version. There's a group, a studio behind it. They're getting some incredible people. And they believe that this is going to take us into a new season of world missions and evangelism where everyone can relate to the characters. They have new um, uh, requirements for how they're going to make the movie. I think they're, they're going to do just a great job. So pray for this film, pray for the studio who's making it, pray for the team who exports it. This is going to be used for all the unreached people groups still left in the world. Their goal is that every unreached person sees this film before they die. And I think that's so important. Well, I have a prophetic word for you today. And I'm going to be talking to you about recognizing when you're under spiritual attack and how to overcome that. I know that spiritual warfare is something that the church just doesn't often talk about. And the people who seem to talk about it seem to be people who see a demon behind every door, people who seem, seem to think everything's a spiritual attack, or there's the people who avoid it. They're spiritual warfare avoiders because they just don't want to look at that spiritual realm because they don't feel empowered or that they have any kind of control over the spiritual realm. So they just kind of go, well, God's going to fight all those battles. But I know I've had seasons of spiritual attack in my life. I'm sure many of you have too. And you can leave in comments anything that makes sense here. And I believe that we're going to get somewhere in this that's going to help you feel empowered when you are in a season of spiritual attack. But I remember one of the seasons we went through where we were working on a project. It was actually a real estate project for our ministry and also, um, yeah, just for our ministry. And I, we were working on this. My wife and I were redoing this in, entire project. And it was just an incredible opportunity that had been somewhat financed for us from an independent uh, donor. And as we did it, every single contractor that came on minus two was incompetent. And they would tell us one thing and they would do something else. A lot of them came on as highly recommended. We had every system on the property broke while we were there. So this property had 
you know, the water systems broke, the electric systems broke. We found out that there was um, a renovation that had been done that had been done illegally, non-permitted. And when we looked through the whole process where they done it, the, the, or the uh, studio and everything should have burned down four times by now, but it hadn't. And I remember just going, this feels compiled. Like everything that can go wrong is going wrong. Plus the systems that were already here are all manifesting something at the same time. Why didn't it happen for the 30 years before we moved here, but they all manifested at once. And we even had uh, one of the staff that ran the property stay with us. And they said that this had never happened, that there was a few problems, but there would never been a condensed season of problems. And it was like pulling a string. We did one thing and all of a sudden everything else broke. And I remember at one point, two of our team members that who are on our ministry team came over to the house to pray for us. And they said, you know, we feel like you're in intense spiritual warfare and you're not looking at it and looking at these things as spiritual excuse me, spiritually rooted. Therefore, you're not applying faith to overcome them. You're just trying to fix them. And now you're exhausted. You're drained. Your resources are gone. You're just, you're, you can't find the right team around it. But if you, if you look at this as a spiritually rooted problem, not just a bunch of natural things all at once, then God's going to give you faith and spiritual authority to be able to overcome where the enemy is trying to energize people's lying against you. Like people who are contractors are saying, I can do it for this much and then try and charge you double or people who are coming in and saying it will only take this long, but it takes 10 times as long. I mean, these, I mean, we had projects that lasted for years that should have lasted for weeks. And it was just so wild to watch so many areas, just the equipment break. Like we had good contractors and they'd say, we never broke our equipment before we came on your property and our equipment broke. And it just happened time and time again. So once the, the prayer team came over and said, Hey, and our ministry team came over and prayed with us. And we just prayed, dedicated again, the land of the Lord. We'd already done it, but we did all kinds of things. We we prayed and poured oil out on the land. We did, took communion on the land. We just said anything that's ever happened here that's not from you, God. We pray that you cleanse it, God. We recognize that there's a spiritual battle, that there's there's the enemy wants this land. And we just dedicated to you. We had our board, our team, everyone pray over it. And it was so wild because when we did that, that week, we did just a bunch of prayer time and just recognizing we then, every time something was happening, engaged it and went, oh, wow, we can discern that the enemy's trying to energize stuff and we're not going to allow it anymore. And we have faith that God's going to fight this battle, but we have to recognize the battle and we're going to overcome it. It was really interesting because we had a turning of the tide. Now, things were still hard at times, but they were no longer energized hard, if you know what I mean. Sometimes you're, you're in a hard season where there's just a lot of hard things. I mean, work is hard. But then there's sometimes when you're in a hard season and stuff feels demonized against you where every process feels like it's so much harder than it should be. And so we're going to talk about this a little bit. And we're going to break down warfare and how to recognize when you're in a season of warfare and what to do about it. Before I do that, we have a, a teacher this month doing a class for four weeks called Craig Brown. He's real time, uh, Bible time Craig Brown on TikTok. He has over a million and a half followers. And Craig is amazing at helping you with the disciplines of life. He's, he helps you to get back into the word, helps you to understand fasting and prayer. What are the things you can do every day? Just a little bit of effort every day will cause your spirituality to grow so much. And we have the Spiritual Growth Academy that Craig Brown's class is on. And I want to encourage you to join the class. It has live components and also pre-recorded components. You're going to be able to ask your questions and be mentored. And if you're in a season where the Bible's not coming alive for you, or you're in a season where you know you're supposed to be fasting or praying more, but you just can't hook in, you can't, you need some help, go to Craig's class. You're going to get so mentored and he's going to show you how to do this and really tune in to the spirit of God and be able to obey what God's showing you and telling you right now. Well, let's talk about this. So there's a spiritual battle, of course, going on at times over all of us. All of us have experienced spiritual battle. And if you don't recognize it, it doesn't mean it's not happening. And God makes you aware of the battle in seasons and times so that you can press through. You can make some changes. You can identify or discern some things, or you can even remove some things from your life. And awareness of the spiritual warfare is really actually a gift. I've learned over all these years, when I become aware that there's a spiritual battle going on, it's a gift so that I can have a different outcome, so that I'm not just stuck the way everybody else might be in culture, where I'm like, oh my gosh, we're so oppressed by when the shutdowns and lockdowns happened with the virus just a couple of years ago. And there was a spiritual battle over nations when it came to this virus. It wasn't just the sickness, but it was the politicized nature of it as well. And it affected families and it tore people apart. And I recognize that there was a spiritual battle that was raging in the nations, let alone our very own spiritual battles that we have over our own destiny, our own careers, our own families, our own marriages. So we have to start to have a, a, or start by having an overcomer's mindset. And that's the first thing that when you are in a season where you start to go, man, some things are happening in my life that just don't feel normal. You have to look at this and go, you know what? The weapons might form, but no weapon formed against me are going to prosper. So this stuff might feel heavy and intense, but it's not going to prosper. If I operate in faith and I recognize that God's going to move in my life, 
no matter what the enemy is doing, I'm still going to look for what God's doing, even in the points where it seems the darkest. And we have to start there. You have to start if you're in a season where marriage is heavy or your kids are rebelling or sickness is on you. And that feels like it's not just normal, like what everybody has in sickness, but you are plagued. You have to look at this and go, God is going to win. Love wins. What Jesus said on the cross is enough. And you have to have an overcomer mentality. And Romans 8, 37 through 39 says, And all these things were more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor any height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, you know, there's this place where so many of us have not been able to maybe come to that overcomer's mindset because the battle has been so intense for the last couple of years for so many people. And you recognize just the battles of life, let alone the spiritual energy that the enemy tries to bring. And there's a, several ways that the battles try and come. And you can, might be able to relate to some of these. There's the relational battles, again, marriage, friendships, family. And when the relational battle comes, a lot of times it comes with misunderstanding, it comes with slander, it comes with accusation, it comes with division over maybe you choose this and it causes people to feel ostracized from you or, or they don't have the maturity to embrace you in the midst of the choices you're making. We see this so many times where people are persecuted for their decisions by their family and closest friends. And sometimes this happens because the enemy is trying to sow seeds of discord or he's trying to bring misunderstanding that can cause division. He hates unity. That's what the enemy hates most. That unity is the superpower of a Christian. Unity is a superpower of humanity. When we have unity over what God wants and what God's doing, it causes us to be a formidable adversary for everything the enemy is doing. And so the enemy is constantly trying to break down relationships. So some of you might have gone through a relational uh, warfare season where you all of a sudden have more accusations than you've ever had against your character that aren't true, or you've had a lot of slander about you, or you've had a lot of misunderstanding, or just people, maybe the closest people to you don't get you right now. Again, misunderstanding is when somebody who's the closest to you says, you're not who I thought you were, and they judge you, they reject you based on something that's not even true. And when you're in a season like that, we're going to talk about it in a minute what to do, but recognize the warfare of that. Let God give you discernment. Another type of warfare a lot of us experience is the resource warfare. When things break or you get extra audits or there's harder financial processes or stuff is stolen. I mean, there's so many, or maybe a natural disaster hits you and it hits everybody, but there's something spiritual about it. I know that there's friends of ours who went through three house fires in three different parts of the country in a row. And they're like, this is weird. And they went and they met with their pastor, who's a very conservative pastor. And they met with him and he said, you know, I think this is spiritual warfare. And he began to pray for him over their security and their stuff. And they had some open doors they didn't realize that they had had from fear that they didn't realize that they had had at all. And he he prayed for them and they, they literally, God removed fear of it happening again. And he showed them his protection, his, his hedge of fire around them, that he is the fire that's going to protect them from the, the fires of the earth. And they've just, you know, that was, I think it was 18 years ago and they've never had a fire since, but I mean, three fires in a row, that's, that's not normal. And there's a lot of stuff when it's not normal that we have to recognize when our, I know our team one time, we were going through a period where we had a lot of stuff that we were printing for events we were doing. And I had books coming out and we had workbooks that we were printing by ourselves. And this is many years ago. Remember Kinko's, there was Kinko's then. And so everything we printed for all of our events, whenever we'd go to print it at any of the printers we use, their printers would break. So I went into Kinko's one time myself with one of my team members who told me we can't successfully print the events on Friday where it's at like a Tuesday. Well, go with me and I'll show you what's happening. We went there. We started the first machine, second machine, third machine. They all broke. Then they tried to print on their own machines that are in the back and they all broke. And they said, we've never had this happen before. It was so ridiculous that we couldn't just get stuff printed. We began to laugh. It actually made us like, well, what we're doing is important, I guess, because this is ridiculous. Like this is not happenstance. It's not common. It's directly related to spiritual fruit that we're about to have, that the enemy's trying to resist the practical. And the enemy loves to resist the practical so that we can't have the spiritual. And it's really important to recognize that. So if you're in a season when stuff's not working, when stuff is stolen, when stuff is uh, is irreparable, when stuff just doesn't go your way and flow your way and it's compiled, so recognize that as warfare and then process when everything gets harder, a lot of times our processes, like this is one of the ways that enemy drains mature people. Maybe they have great boundaries in relationships. It's not a season of relation, relational discord. So the enemy will try and make everything take 10 times longer than it should. The enemy tries to make the circumstances harder. It makes circumstances of processes like getting banking or IRS stuff or whatever else 
become like quicksand. I mean, financial processes, whatever it is. He wants to bring frustration, discouragement, and endless process. If you want to know what hell is like, it's like standing in a two-hour DMV line. It's just the most sterile, awful thing you've ever experienced. And so if the enemy could bring endless process to you, to distract you, to take your energy from what you should have energy on, he will do it. That's why some people immigrate and the enemy tries to use that immigration process to destroy your faith and your future destiny in that country. Many people, you know, go through going, they, they have a word, I'm going to become an entrepreneur and make a lot of money. And the first thing that happens is you get targeted by the IRS unjustly and you have audits that don't make sense. And we've seen it happen over and over and over for people and friends. And when you start to recognize it, it's really important that you recognize also John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you can have life and life abundantly. So we identify these battles. And when we start to identify that it's a real battle, we start to have power that we would have never had if we don't have an identifying marker discernment. Because when you discern something, you can then operate in faith, not just normal. My wife and I are famous for like forgetting to operate in faith. Our kids get sick and the first thing we do is go grab the Tylenol. And we're like, wait a minute, or the Benadryl, whatever it is. We're like, wait a minute, the first thing we should be doing is praying. Not that it's warfare, but there's the power of healing in our hands because of Jesus. And so the first thing we want to do is pray and give it to God, give the circumstance to God. But a lot of times our first default is human. And we've had to train ourselves to be spiritual and spiritually minded. I love John 16, 33. It's I, Jesus, have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you're going to have a lot of trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So there has to be that linking to faith of like God showing us that there's spiritual roots sometimes or there's demonic uh, principalities and powers in the world around us. There's warfare and relationships. There's all the things we just said. And when we understand that, then we can all become alert to it and operate in faith. First Peter 5, 8 through 9 is the scripture to back this. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around you like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. So in other words, be alert. Don't look at your natural problems as always spiritual. But when they are spiritual, when you, your discernment turns on, you go, wait a minute, this is actually, I need to have faith in this circumstance and I need to understand it as a spiritual rooted problem, not just a naturally rooted problem. Then you start to operate in a different capacity and you need that capacity when you go through seasons of warfare. And if you've never been told that before, I'm telling you today, and if you haven't told that before, let me remind you today because some of you are in warfare and you needed to hear this. Colossians 1, 13 through 14, it says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought, thank you, Jesus, and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves and whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. And so we've already been rescued. And when we experience that discernment turns on, we start to realize there's warfare. The enemy's trying to come against me. He's trying to kill, steal, and destroy in my life. Then when we have that discernment, it helps us to, again, operate in a new capacity. I love two of the main ways that we get this kind of discernment. One way is dreams. And I remember having a dream type experience where I was face to face with a demon. This thing came right up to me, like as in that dream when you were kind of waking up and you're in between sleep and awake. And he said, I'm going to take away your favor and friendships and your finances. So favor, friendships, and finances. He literally says that. I was so young and I was terrified. I was like, this was so, I woke up with that feeling of like dread, like my life could be over if God doesn't rescue me. But there was nothing facing me in the natural that I could see that would be true about this, but it was so authentic. And I was like, I can't, I have to believe this is a spiritual experience. What do I do about it? And I remember um, even having in the dream, a mental picture of myself being stripped of everything that was good. So I tell a friend of mine who's a prayer warrior about it because it made me so nervous. I couldn't shake it for a couple of weeks. And, and she said, you know what? This is a really good spiritual experience. And I said, what? She's like, I'm so glad this has happened. And I'm thinking, why? That sounds so mean. She goes, well, the enemy's revealing himself so that you know that there's a battle ahead. So when weird things try and stir up, you can catch them. You can discern it so it doesn't destroy you. So you can have it ahead of time. Have you ever had a dream that there's spiders crawling on you? Have you ever had a dream that there's snakes trying to bite you? I know one of my best friends had a dream that there's a pool full of snakes and it was representing our church over and he was a pastor of the church and that um, there were snakes and we were having to catch them and pull them out. And it represented seeds of gossip. What we didn't know is that one of the associate pastors who had come out in an alternative lifestyle um, privately, but without no, and he was a pastor on the staff that he was sowing seeds of discord and he was releasing slender and the enemy was trying to use it to bring a destruction of the church. We didn't realize that at the time, but when he had the dream, we were like, Oh my gosh, you're having just a dream about snakes. It's not just a dream about snakes that are venomous. It's actually, we need to 
check in with people who've been bit by this thing so that venom doesn't kill them and take out that venom and have relational one-on-one times with them so we can undo the poison that's gone in. And so when you have these dreams, these are warfare dreams, like again, spiders, snakes, dark figures, slanderous people, these kinds of things. This is God warning you so that you can actually have faith to do something about it, that it's not going to come against you. The weapon might form, but it will not destroy you. That means that there might be some process that's uncomfortable because a lot of times when you have a warning dream, there's going to be a process that you have to walk through that God's going to be with you. Don't be afraid for I'm with you, says the Lord. There's going to be a process that's hard because you're going to have to walk through it. But man, when he shows it to you, isn't it better to know that it's going to happen and that he'll walk through you than not know it's going to happen and you just get ambushed. It's so much better. Second Thessalonians 3, 3 says, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. The other way that we have you know, discernment that comes through is you just get a feeling or a knowing that something's off, something's wrong. Maybe you feel like in a relationship that somebody has an evil intention or an agenda or maybe a judgment towards you. Maybe it could be as someone as close as your family and when you discern that and you notice the sermon, it's not just you people reading or going, man, something's wrong with mom today. But it's actually like, wow, my friend's mom is actually upset with me. There's something in her heart towards me. Then you could start, you could actually pray into that. Sometimes you can even have a direct conversation of like, hey, is there anything wrong with us? Sometimes it's so energized demonically that it's the enemy is just trying to ambush or, or be like a predator around you. And God will give you a strategy around it. So how do you really fight? Well, prayers for real prayers. Second Corinthians 10, four through five says the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds and we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Another one that is really important in this is James 4, 7. Well, let me go back real fast because it says take every thought captive as well. So when you go through a season of warfare, there's a, a feeling of impending doom. Like you can start to feel a lot of times you'll discern the strategy of the enemy. You'll discern that the enemy wants to take you out through the sickness. Maybe there's a sickness on your body. I remember being sick. Many of you have heard my story. If you, if you're not new to me that I was sick with a parasite and the doctor sent me home for hospice because I'd taken chemo. And I remember just feeling the looming demonic. I got it on a missions trip. It was like, it shouldn't have happened. It was from a, a parasite that doesn't even exist. And the region that I was in, it was from some, some sort of food I ate or something that I was so careful and at the same time, I was dealing with warfare over a movement where the movement was dismantling because there was leaders coming against the, the, the senior pastor and the senior pastor needed his strategy. And it was really, really a hard time. And so I was speaking into their process and I got sick. And when I was sick, I identified it as spiritual. And I, I had to hold on spiritually to the fact that, God, you've showed me myself as an old man, but this thing's going to take me off and I won't live all the days that you've planned. So align my faith for your vision and your dream for my life. And I had to come into a spiritual alignment because every day my body would tell me you're going to die soon. Every day the doctors would say, there's no hope for you. There's no other medicine we, we can put you on. But every day I would wake up and say, for your sake, I will live and not die. For your sake, God. And so we get these spiritual empowered messages from being rooted and grounded in the word sometimes. And, and if I had died, I died. But I felt like that was, it's better to believe in faith and and be disappointed by going to heaven than it is, which is no disappointment, than it is to just live as a normal person. Well, people die all the time. But what if you're not supposed to die yet? What if there's life for you? Now, there's a whole movement in the Anglican church right now in the UK of allowing people to do assisted suicide. Now, I understand this. And I'm not going to go into the whole morality of that. But the majority of people who want to do committed, uh, assisted suicide are not in the final weeks of their life. They're early on and stages of diseases that can be overcome. I mean, we had a friend of ours who just overcame stage four cancer last month. He's completely clear. And I mean, he'll be checking for the next few years, but stage four, they were saying it's, we're so sorry it's spread too far in your body where they didn't give him a lot of hope. And he heard from God and God healed him. And he's not, he's, he's a Christian. He loves Jesus, but he's not very deep in his faith, but he heard God and is going to go deep in his faith now because he's been healed. So God can heal people. God can restore. And I love that operation of compassion that we need to let people die with dignity. But there's something about short circuiting, though, what God can do. When you have a church without power, we'll lean into false compassion. And it happens all the time. And it creates more warfare. It's just crazy. Side note. That's a side point. James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And this is a huge warfare point. That when you recognize you're under warfare, like when we recognize we're under warfare with all the equipment breaking around us, we'd have every sound system and soundboard. For, I mean, if, I think we for three years we did 38 conferences and we had over 18 
soundboards at the conferences die during our event. We would even call people and joke around and say, make sure to have insurance on your soundboard because we're coming and the soundboards for whatever reason die because the whole event will stop if the soundboard dies. And we had this happen so many times. So during that season of time, when we recognized it as warfare, we were playing like it wasn't warfare for a while, but we recognized it was warfare. And we said, you know what, God, we resist the enemy from from uh, from resisting us. We're going to resist him. And so if the soundboard goes on, we're going to continue the meeting. We're going to press in further. We're going to press in harder. We're going to do more. And we would have more power whenever anything died, whenever the equipment died. So I think the enemy just got bored with us or was like, this isn't working and either change the strategy or, or fl fleed from us because then we didn't have anything happen for years with equipment, which is so beautiful until that property that we were stewarding. Well, Ephesians 6, 10 through 11, I know a lot of you guys know this, but it says, be strong in the Lord's power, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the de devil's schemes. Now, when you do that, some of you are raised in Baptist church like I was, so you actually prayed the full armor of God on and you were taught to pray it every day. And it's that's a beautiful sentiment. I love that. But it has to be real to you. It has to be like the shield of faith having that shield around you that says, God, I know that I'm a spiritual being first. So I know that there's an enemy out there that's prowling to destroy me, but I have faith that you've already overcome. So I'm going to walk when something hits me that's hard. I'm going to walk in the opposite culture. So when someone with customer service yells at me, I'm actually going to try not to escalate it, but I'm going to try and respond in love, which I didn't do this weekend. I had a really hard time. And so I'm repenting right now in front of all of you. I had a little bit of a moment with a customer service representative at uh, an airline I flew, but most of the time I, I don't escalate it. I actually de-escalate and can operate in love. But when you escalate it, when you don't operate in the spirit, then it turns into a process and it turns into everybody loses. But when it's a spiritual thing and you don't escalate it, but you operate in the opposite spirit and you take your stand with faith instead of just with what you need to get out of it, man, you get God. I've watched people get sued who are incredible Christians who I know who got sued under false pretense. And instead of fighting back in a normal legal way, God would give them a strategy of love and where he would be their defender and the whole thing disappeared. And I just think it's so beautiful when you stand and the enemy resists you because you're standing in faith or it's maybe it's, you know, your, your feet shot of a gospel of peace. When you actually walk with the knowledge of what's in the word, when you have a biblical worldview and you understand the Bible, you have the Bible memorized, you start to walk in a different way because like Jesus, when he was in the wilderness and the enemy came and assaulted him, he literally quoted scripture at the, the enemy. And, and at the devil. And I think that's such a powerful message. You know, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what God, what is common to mankind. And God's faithful. He's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he's also going to provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, this is huge that you understand that when there's spiritual warfare and when there's even temptation to be human and normal, and this is, this you apply this to sin or you apply to spiritual warfare, that you understand when there's spiritual warfare, you're not the only one. Like Elijah felt like he was the only one who'd ever experienced warfare and who would ever experience what he experienced. And that it was the only prophet. And God's like, no, there's all these prophets over here. Like you're not alone. And other people face battles too. And I think when we get isolated and alone, that's when the enemy can actually, the warfare works because you start to get destroyed in your ability to, you get murdered in your ability to have a relationship. You get defiled in your ability to have destiny because you now feel alone, you're isolated, you've allowed that weapon to form against you, as opposed to saying, you know what, something's wrong with this. I'm going to do everything I can within my spiritual authority, which I have authority over my life, over my health, to make healthy, good decisions, over my finances, to, to, to work as hard as I need to, to live the life God's called me to, over my relationships, to get the healthiest I can through counseling, inner healing, to have the healthiest boundaries I can. And when you do all that and you stand firm in your faith in those areas, when that warfare comes, it doesn't mean that it won't hurt for a minute or it doesn't mean that you won't suffer for a minute. But on the other end of it, here's what you're not always told is when warfare breaks out, there's this weird excitement in a lot of Christians because we understand when a war breaks out against us, there's about to be a victory that we couldn't have attained by ourselves. There's something that's going to happen on the other end of that that's greater than anything we've ever experienced before. I've met authors who have the most warfare when they're writing their book. I've met business leaders who are you know, entrepreneurs who are about to have the biggest breakthrough of their life, but it feels like hell before that. They can't even see that there's going to be a breakthrough anymore because they're so entrenched in the day-to-day -day grind of awfulness. And then once you get through that period, because it doesn't last forever, it rains and then it pours. And then, the, and then all of a sudden the sun comes out. And when the sun comes out, which is the day that the Lord starts to manifest his promise for you, you will forget the pain of the warfare that you endured because the good is so good. And that's something that I want to tell you is like, maybe you're having warfare in a relationship. Maybe you're having warfare in finances. Maybe you're having warfare in your health. When that battle is won, 
when you're on the other end, and it's already been one in Jesus, but when it's one in your faith and when that warfare ends and whenever that season of warfare push comes towards you, you have to realize like the worst it is, the better the breakthrough is going to be. Maybe you've never been told that before. It doesn't mean you should anticipate it. And it doesn't mean there has to be a war before every breakthrough. But if there is a spiritual battle, recognize, even at the beginning of it, go, you know, when you're first starting to sense that, when you're going, this is awful. Like this, these things that are happening are not right. At the beginning, say to yourself, say to your spirit to encourage yourself, but God is going to get such a big victory through this that I will be smiling and I will be, I will have so much like Job had a war. Satan came to sift him and said, I can make him turn against you. And God said, not Job. And the worst things happened to Job in his lifetime. And in the end, he had so much more in his relationship with God and he had double everything else. And you just think about that and go, okay, this war is hard, but you know what? This isn't a forever war. Now, those of you who've lived in what you call warfare for decades, that's not how it works in the kingdom. If you're in warfare for decades, your boundaries are off, your balance is off, and that's not a biblical war view because Jesus has come to give you life and not death. And that means if you're living in a season where everything ends, everything's bad, everything's hard, the enemy's always against you, that means you haven't learned how to live a balanced Christian life. It means that there might be some inner healing counseling you need to get. There might be some, like if you're at war with the world, and you're, that means you're at war with yourself. That means that you don't live a fullness or fulfillment in your Christianity right now and what God can do in your very real life. It's one of the reasons why I do this show is that you can discern what God's doing in yourself. You can discern what God's doing in your culture and politics and the church, and you can live with your tank of hope full, not always in conspiracy for what the enemy is doing because the enemy is always making moves, but God always has them checkmated. And so if you feel like the enemy is always moving and everything's against me and I'm you know doing terrible and I've, I've you know, hit especially charismatics and Pentecostals who live that way where their glass is always half empty. Yeah, God's moving, but the enemy's doing this and this. And if you watch this video, have you seen this? Have you seen this? And you live in this mindset that is so unempowered because you don't enjoy the fruit of your salvation. You don't enjoy what God is doing because you're always in conspiracy for what God's not doing, what the enemy's doing wrong, what man's doing wrong. And that's just not a way to live. So people are so warfare minded that you stay in the battle. It's like a PTSD. You can't get out of the trauma. That's not healthy either. So there are seasons of, of warfare. There's seasons of being able to discern the demonic. There's seasons of be, being able to discern demonic energy and empowerment over, again, relationships or over industries against you or over. I mean, I know it happens with business leaders. If you listen to our Explain the Marketplace, sometimes a business leader will share, like, I was trying to, you know, do my business and this whole other industry tried to shut me down. And it was like a spiritual battle that I'd never been through before. And it's just so profound when you hear those stories because it teaches you how to go to, to war with the weapons of our warfare, which often are the opposite of what we would think they are. We're not going to go and shut everyone down. We might go and get everyone saved. We're not going to go and, you know, destroy all the works of the enemy ourselves. God's going to do that. And we're just going to be good, do good and love good. I mean, it's just, it's just so incredible when you understand God's operation system. Well, that's the show. You guys are awesome. I'm just going to pray for you for the warfare. If you're in a season of warfare, God, give us discernment. Help us in our spirit and our life, God. Help us to understand you. Help us to know what to do with warfare in our life. Help us to have these scriptures engaged in our spirit. Help us to know how to live in the land of fulfillment of John 10 and Jesus name. Well, thanks for watching today. Love you guys. Merry Christmas. We really believe that God's going to use this Christmas season for you in a profound way. Remember that we are a ministry. We are supported by the generous donations by people just like you. I want to encourage you to leave a donation today by going to bullsministries.com. It's tax deductible if you're here in America. And we love you guys from all over the world. We're so glad you're with us. Thanks for making this one of the top news commentary podcasts in the world. And I'll see you next time.